Contestants from all over the UK have come to pitch their ideas to four of the industry's leading technology specialists. Emerging and startup technology companies have come to London for their chance to have their pitch heard. Judges Neil Catamore and Andrew McLean from Compare the Cloud will be joined by guest judges each month. But this isn't about delivering just any pitch. It's about who's got what it takes to deliver the perfect pitch. Hi and welcome to Disruptive Pitch, where X Factor meets Bake Off. I'm your host, David Fern, and we're going to take you over the next six months through a bunch of really innovative, interesting technologies. But we're not just going to show you them, we're not just going to talk about them, we're going to get the owners and founders, the CEOs and development managers to stand up and pitch their heart out to you to try and win a spot on either Team Andy or Team Neil. What we're trying to do is make sure that nobody has access to anything that they shouldn't have. Things that we're actually piloting is uh, crowd control and proactive policing. Stop people that shouldn't have access to an area having access to that area. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Very well. So if you'd like to quickly introduce yourself. Sure. So my name is Peter Bradley. I'm CEO of Torsion Information Security and I'm very happy to be invited along. Brilliant. Brilliant. So do you do this often? Is this something you, uh, you get involved oh, with? A lot of pitching? As it, as it comes up, yeah. You know, the life of a, a CEO of a startup is... I was going to say, it must be very exciting. pretty often. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck. Thank you. Have fun and we shall see you when it's over. Great. Thank Cheers. You. So my name is Peter Bradley. I'm CEO of Torsion Information Security. So what we're doing at Torsion is we're focused on the problem of accurate access control. So trying to make sure that people in organisations have access to only the information that they should have in order to be able to do their jobs, but more importantly, none of the information that they shouldn't have, uh, which could put the company at risk if they have access to things that they shouldn't have. Uh, so the, the nature of our technology is that we are a system that runs in the cloud and connects uh, to all of the systems where our customers are storing their information. So both in the, prem in, in the data center and in the cloud, using systems such as SharePoint Online, Google Drive, legacy file shares, CRM systems, uh, enterprise social systems such as Yammer and, and, and some of the other enterprise social si uh, systems. What we're trying to do is make sure that nobody has access to anything that they shouldn't have which is a very, very difficult problem to, to handle right now because you tend to have uh, companies with millions of documents and thousands of staff and constant business change. And so the, the classical ways of trying to approach this problem tend to focus on business processes, IT guys pushing and pulling on levers. Those processes and tools absolutely get swamped by the volume of information and the constant pace of change. And so you end up with people that worked on this account for two months last year and then nobody took their access away. They have gone on to something else now, but they still have access to that stuff. Puts the company at all kinds of risk. At the same time, that can introduce a very big compliance challenge. So for some organizations and some industries, particularly uh, finance and heavily regula regulated industries, if you've got people with access to information that they shouldn't have, then that company can be exposed to all kinds of regulatory risk. If you're not, ab not able to very quickly show who has access to something, then there's uh, regulatory risk around that as well. So the value that we're adding to our customers comes down to reducing the risk of people having access to things that they shouldn't have. It comes down to streamlining the compliance with, with regulations and standards that are focused on information security, such as GDPR and Sarbanes-Oxley and ISO 27001, uh, PCI DSS. And the third element of our business value boils down to more efficient uh, sharing of information. So when, you, when a person and a company feels more confident in sharing their information, be it sensitive or otherwise, then the business is going to be more efficient. It's going to work better when people have access to information. It just has to be done in a controlled way. And so what Torsion allows us to do is to provide that control at scale in a way that is precise and automatic. Now the way that our tech works, we try to make inferences about who actually needs access to what, one document at a time. So we're talking about millions and millions of little decisions. And so the way the technology works is using a number of things, including we tap into the stream of HR data, so we can actually model the structure of the organization and figure out what people are doing and where they are at any given time. We overlay that with business rules, with classifications, with artificial intelligence, monitoring who is actually accessing what documents and therefore 
making uh, automated inferences about, well, who needs access to what and who should not have access to what. I'll, I'll begin with a, a question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned artificial intelligence. Yeah. What exactly do you mean by artificial intelligence? So the, the big data set that we're looking at is what documents exist, what people exist, who is opening what document, who is doing what with what document. And then when we intersect that set of information with our knowledge of who the people are, what they're assigned to, uh, information coming from HR systems, from timesheeting systems, the, 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 the SAP systems, anything that, that actually stores intelligence on who the people are and what they're doing. By intersecting those two data sets, we now have a very deep uh, set, well, deep, deep set of, of, uh, of, of data for us to begin mining and, and uh, draw automated decisions out of the back of it. Peter. You mentioned regulatory requirements. Yes. Um, in a nutshell, how do you enforce that? How do we enforce that? Like a rule set, do you have a template, or how do you ensure that that's always up to date? Sure. So the rule set really is we wrap rules around collections of information and then use those rules to actually um, make decisions about who gets access to something. But those rules, whilst it's a technical enabler, it's all, from a business perspective, a rule is really just a reason why somebody has access to something. Right? Here's a document. He has access to it because he's the manager on the ABC account. Uh, he works in the London office and he's in the director role, something like that. And so that is a reason. That's a business reason why somebody has access to something. And those reasons are the crux of these what these regulations actually require. Right? You need to be able to point at a document and say, well, these people have access to it for this reason. They were given access on this date by this person for this reason, and they will lose access automatically on this date in the future when this happens. Right? These regulations, they tend to boil down to the ability to demonstrate that level of control and to do it quickly. So, so this is what we're, in, what we're providing to our customers. Yeah, hi. Um, what are the key markets you success in the moment? The, sorry? The key markets. Right, so we're currently focused on a few verticals. The first is around financial services, uh, so investment management, hedge funds. Uh, these kinds of organisations deal with very large documents of very sensitive information. They're typically not the biggest companies in the world, and so they need to be able to move very large volumes of information through the organisation quickly and be confident that people have access to only the things that they need. The second is around professional services. So we've had a number of very good conversations with law firms, with accountancy firms. These companies need to be able to draw boundaries around the sets of information that they manage. So let's take the case of a law firm. They need to draw a boundary around the information pertaining to a case. They need to be confident that none of the lawyers that have access to anything have a conflict on any one of those millions of documents that might pertain to a case. Who are those lawyers? How do you intersect that with who's on the case today, who's not on it tomorrow, who has a conflict on this, who doesn't, but at the same time, how can we reuse information within this case on a selective way such that we can make it firm IP and make the firm as a whole more efficient? This is very, very complex. And so this is the kind of problem that is just too complex for any business process to really handle. The third vertical that we're looking at is public sector. So we've had a number of very good conversations with, with public sector departments, very concerned with, with regulatory compliance, GDPR just around the corner, um, trying to help these government departments make sure that the information doesn't leak outside of the, the relevant silos, but that they can very rapidly demonstrate exactly who has access to what and why um, in, in satisfaction of their regulatory requirements. Um, my question is, how long does it take to set this up in the mm -hmm. beginning, given that you're using AI and various things sure. to, if you like, mine the new customer's data yep. for your service to become sure. relevant? So, uh, so a typical customer can be up and running in about two hours. Now, what, what happens is the, the engine running in the cloud, there's a 30-day free trial. They can simply go on there, activate the trial, connect our engine running in the cloud with the first of their information management systems that they want us to help with. Uh, so let's say that is Office 365. There is a, a connection process where our engine is granted the, the controls it needs inside of the Office 365 environment. From that moment on, we can start providing all kinds of visibility um, over who has access to what, what information exists, who has access to it, when did they get it, um, point at a document, how many people have access to it. Well, there's 74 people that have access to this document. This is who they are, and this is why they have it. Right away, that's a very, very difficult problem to, to, that's a very difficult thing to do. And then over time, so we don't have to automatically control access on day one. 
perhaps day one we just provide this visibility and reporting capability and then going forward they can gradually allow us more and more uh, control we can start automating access we can start doing more and more data mining and the, the the data mining and ai stuff really comes in when you allow us to actually control who has access to this document and that document when you've got so many documents when we can actually start providing that access control um, then this is where the ai stuff comes in Peter, I have a question. You must generate massive amounts of data and information, mm -hmm. auditing and logging. What do you do with it? Right, so, so we have a database running in the cloud, um, which with a database per, per each of our customers. So each of those databases is, is obviously secured and segmented, so no, no data will ever leak across customer boundaries. Um, but yeah, it's all stored, stored in our big SQL data, uh, database in the cloud. Thank you. Okay. Right. Peter, thank, you thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all right. Interesting. Not bad. Good. Not bad. Yeah, good. some really good questions so there. Got the, uh, got the gist of the products and did, yeah. got the general sort of what it's, it was all about. It's always great when the questions indicate that they, they knew exactly what we were talking about and people kind of recognise this problem space. Brilliant. No, it's a problem space that's been around for years. Exactly. And, um, you know, looking at bringing these new techs, artificial intelligence and other things into solving an ages old problem and doing it better and faster and more efficiently. Perfect. Um, yeah, so it's great. Fantastic, well good luck. Let's hope Thank you get you. voted on and yeah, speak to you soon. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Okay, so one pitch down and, uh, and four more to go. So let's bring in, without further ado, let's bring in our next guest. Hi. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. If you'd like to just introduce yourself to the camera, that'd be fantastic. Hi, I'm Vignesh from Massive Analytic. Brilliant. So what does Massive, well, in, in 30 seconds, what does Massive Analytics do? Well, we're in the business of uh, helping people identify insights in their data they, di they didn't know existed, yeah. to ask questions they didn't know they could, <clears throat> to identify the impact of decisions they had not made yet. Fantastic. Sounds absolutely awesome. Thank you. Well, I'll send you through to the judges immediately. Thank Good you. luck. Thank really you so hope much. it goes well, and we'll see you back in here afterwards sure. for a quick debrief. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, next one on, and uh, let's see how he does. Over to you, judges. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Vignesh from Massive Analytic. We are an AI-driven analytics business, providing Can you tell analytic me solutions off camera? for different so I don't stop. Data. There are two products that our company is developing, one of which is available in the market right now and the other is close to market, so I'm going to talk to you about both of them. The first one's called Oscar. Oscar is in the business of allowing users to identify insights in data that they didn't know existed, allowing them to ask questions they didn't know they had to ask so that they can understand the impact of the decisions they are going to make before they actually make them. It allows them to do this by providing regular analysts and seasoned data scientists a code-free interface by automating a lot of algorithms and analytical processes. What's more is that we provide this in a browser-based platform that doesn't sit on your computer. So the scalability aspect of the solution is limitless. One day you could be analyzing, uh, in the morning you could be analyzing a few megabytes of data, and in the afternoon you could be scaling up to a few gigabytes or terabytes should you want to by leveraging the power of the cloud. Now what we are able to achieve by these three uh, capabilities is that we're able to shorten the decision episode significantly. Decisions that used to take days and weeks for organizations and a whole bunch of teams now will only take minutes and hours based on the kind of uh, deployment that you have of Oscar in your system. That solution is right now available for people to use. Uh, the other solution we're working on is a video analytics product, which has still not been named yet. Uh, we are able to detect patterns in live video data and predict certain behaviors that are going to happen before they actually happen. So this video uh, analytic application has multifarious ap uh, applications in um, proactive policing, uh, could be uh, security and compliance, uh, advertising and media, and those industries. So these are the products we have, um, and we are continuously innovating them. The roadmap sees us actually uh, making Oscar a lot more user-friendly, providing guided workflows for for analysts by telling them how to analyze the data. And on the 
And on the video side, we see that being able to predict, say, about four to five seconds in advance, a behavior that is going to take place. Um, video analytics. Sure. I mean, are we talking about things like crowd controls when large groups of crowds Absolutely, gather? Absolutely, yes. Um, so <coughs> we've, uh, through some of our customer engagements, one of the things that we're actually piloting is uh, crowd control and mm. proactive policing. Um, one of the things we're also looking at is uh, if, if you have been to the Nottingham uh, Festival mm -hmm. uh, uh, and if you've seen the police records, <laughs> one of the things that they focus on is identifying uh, fights, uh, drug offenses, et cetera, et cetera. Right now it's being done by people, on, policemen on the foot, radioing each other and things like that. One of the things that can be done if that becomes a solution is that cameras would automatically pick up certain patterns and behaviors and send messages to police officers to say this is where this is happening and uh, that is a lot better way of policing than actually using eyeballs all the time. Politics is a busy marketplace. That's right. Yourself? Well, uh, which is what I started with. Uh, all our competitors, uh, if you're using their products, what you would need to know is you would need to know what question to first of all ask the system and it only gives you the insights based on the questions you've asked. What has happened is with, with the large amount of data that you're collecting, that organizations are collecting, it is almost impossible to know what question you have to ask. You need systems to actually tell you these are the interesting insights in your data based on the questions you have not asked, prompting users to ask more questions and we also have the predictive analytics capability where if they have asked those questions and they've decided that this is how I'm going to answer these questions, you can actually know beforehand the impact of your decisions and then make them more intelligently. And if all of this is done in a short manner, then you're making the moves before the market moves ahead of you. Very good answer. Thank you. Um, you talked briefly about the first product set. Not, we, I understand how your, um, the live video analytics sure. it could be very interesting. I'm interested in, in what Oscar. You, yeah, Oscar That's at the right. moment. If you could just explain a little bit more about that and how you implement that. Sure. Um, so it's a, have, I, I assume you have used some uh, analytics uh, products. So um, Oscar is Im implemented on the cloud. So it's not an installable program on your computer. It works off of a browser. So you could be on Chrome, Safari, Explorer, if people still continue to use it. Um, and you could be analyzing, you could be sitting on a train coming into the city and analyzing gigabytes of data that you're not going to be able to do with our product. So this is deployed both as a software as a service on the cloud and we also have versions that will work inside uh, an organization's firewall as well but will still be display, uh, deployed through a browser. Just um, picking up on that, this idea that we can remotely start to analyze data, sure. how do you handle the security issues with that? So uh, we are encrypting our data both at rest and motion. At, at rest, we have the, the cloud security available. Uh, in motion, we are uh, continuously improving the security um, that we will have when we're pulling data from different sources. From the use cases that we are uh, facing, uh, people who are using it on transit already have the data uh, uh, static in a particular uh, server or a box somewhere. So we've really not come across places where someone is actually pumping in gigabytes sitting on a train up into a server. But all of our roadmap sees us even solving that. But then again, as you might know from your experience, you solve a problem once it becomes a problem. So we are aware that it will become a problem. And when we do find those customers who have those problems, we will prioritize those developments and do that. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Any future developments? The future developments. Um, so one, one of the things we hear from customers very often is like, Vignesh, uh, there are analysts who should be analyzing data. But then very often, they don't do what they have to do because they're scared to go even and touch the data. They don't know where to start. So one of the things that we're doing is uh, over the next six to eight months, we are developing a capability that will do this analytics, uh, that will help them do this analytics in an assisted manner. So the moment the person uploads a data set um, uh, or uh, data from a data source, it would, uh, it would immediately tell them, it will construct a dashboard automatically say, hey, this is what I think I know about your data. What are you actually interested in knowing? And then the person can actually do a drill down analysis saying, I'm interested in this graph. And then it's gonna pick out 
the variables that you're analyzing in that graph and come up with another dashboard to say, this is what's driving these variables that you're interested in. And what we're also doing inside Oscar is we are profiling usage patterns. We're actually seeing what kind of users use what kind of analysis. And we're actually doing analytics on our own data to actually figure out which are the next kind of features that we want to develop. Interesting. Super. Any other questions, guys? No, good. Thank no, you. no, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's go back into the next room. I think I went. I thought that went well. I was expecting a few more questions, but I guess I might have either bamboozled him or answered all the questions without them asking him. Uh, I think you definitely uh, answered all the questions very, very easily. Super. Yeah, so uh, one question I have for you, though, is, sure. uh, is what do you see the future of analytics being? Because obviously they spoke about what is here, what is now, but I mean, what's the future of analytics from your perspective? Well, I, uh, our vision, actually, for analytics is that um, analytics is going to be democratized. Just about anybody is going to be able to do analytics because the systems are going to become so smart that um, you wouldn't need expert, uh, expert, expert coding or uh, analysis skills. Yeah. As long as you have a good head on your shoulders, understand the business, you'd be able to do that. And we see analytics automating a lot of business decisions. Fantastic. So it's all about moving into that line of business rather than the sort of IT department reporting Absolutely, the traditional. Yes sort of view of analytics. Well, that's fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so really much. Really good luck and uh, yeah, hopefully you go as well. Appreciate the opportunity. Not a problem at all, not a problem at all. Okay, so we're keeping them going. So next we have Ashura, so please do come in. Hello. Hi, how nice are you doing? You. Nice to meet you too. So if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, my name's Andy Craft. I'm from Ashuria. Brilliant. So, uh, so what does Ashuria do in sort of 30 seconds? In 30 seconds, we're a cybersecurity business. We deliver world-class defense-grade technology to mainly enterprise businesses. So we're selling into governments, we're selling into defense businesses, and indeed um, high-end commercial businesses, so banks uh, and so forth. Perfect. So uh, before you go into the judges, I'd like to ask you and ask a couple of the other uh, contestants, how did you hear about this? How did you get onto a uh, disruptive pitch? Well, we've been very lucky to, to be in a position where we've, we've been speaking to a number of people over some time and uh, came across uh, one of our contacts who said, had this marvellous opportunity to come here today Brilliant. and actually do something really exciting, really innovative, and hopefully uh, get something out of it. Brilliant. Well, fantastic. Without further ado, I shall send you the judges. Thank you Good luck, indeed. and I'll speak to you here afterwards. Thank you. Then. Thank you very much. So our next contestant goes into the judges and uh, fingers crossed he's successful and uh, convinces them that he's the right stuff for the job. Hello. Hello. So there was an interesting figure I saw and heard about uh, recently, which is cybersecurity is now bigger than all other types of cybercrime put together. So the cybercrime element is now bigger than the murderers and the thieving and everything else that we all think of as security. security is growing enormously within the cyber world. My name is Andy Croft. I'm from a company called Ashoria. And today what we are doing is launching our new SOC, regional SOC service, which is all about delivering world-class defense-grade cybersecurity to mid-market businesses in a way that is affordable and in a way that is accessible. So traditionally, we have been around for a few years and we've been very successful in delivering uh, our software. We're a UK company, it's developed in the UK, we own all the IP, and we've been developing this software for 10 or so years. And we sell into large enterprise level businesses, we sell into government departments, and we sell into defense and other high security areas. So what we're doing is we're taking all that expertise all that specialist knowledge and we're packaging it in a way that allows smaller businesses to access the same quality that we've been able to supply to the big boys so far. So that's about finding a way of delivering a simple to use, easily understood managed service that is at a reasonable price and that is accessible in a way that allows the company to get on with their job of making money rather than having to work worry about security. So the typical target for us are people who do not have cybersecurity experts in-house. They're the sort of companies where they recognize that there are some issues that they have, 
They perhaps got their traditional firewalls and antivirus, and they've got most of that in place, but they're aware that there is a lot more that's going to be needed. And the question is, what is that extra stuff that I need? So we focus on um, some of the key areas that the government itself is suggesting that small businesses should initially focus on. And this is all about uh, the um, hygiene, the cyber security hygiene area. And that essentially boils down to making sure you know what is on your network in terms of systems and devices, making sure that you configure those systems and devices in such a way as to make sure that they are as secure as possible, getting rid of vulnerabilities, making sure that you're up to date with your patches, making sure that your file system is configured in such a way to stop people that shouldn't have access to an area having access to that area. So that's one area. And then the second one is having secured and locked down your systems, you then need to be able to basically install a CCTV to look at the people that are coming into your system and perhaps doing things that you don't want them to. Hackers, of course, being an obvious one. So that's suspicious activity. You're looking for the exceptions. The person coming in from a Chinese IP address at 3 a.m. in the morning clearly is unlikely to be one of your employees, and you probably want to go and look at what they are um, doing in your business. I, I have one uh, immediate thought, really. What makes your product special from a, a large cap to an SME point of view? What is the differentiator? Well, I, th I think the point is that so we have been successful in selling in to very large businesses. So if you look at our client list, there's some very enviable names there. And given that that's the case, and that because we do own our I own IP and because we are able to control our market the way we want, we can afford to price in a way and package in a way that means that mid-market businesses that perhaps today cannot afford all the infrastructure, including the people and processes to support the sort of thing we traditionally have sold in, uh, now they're able to do so. So it's about taking that quality and packaging it in a way through a managed service that uh, allows them to get access to that quality. When you um, talk about delivering it as a managed service, what does that mean? Well, how do you define managed service? So a managed service to us means that the customer is able to log in to a website through a portal and to control themselves, the profiling, the configuration of their systems, to basically say, this is the sort of business we are, we, we operate this way, we run these sort of um, uh, times, uh, hours of, of operation, we, we have these sort of establishments spread around, this is our technology, how it's all put together, and through that, um, they can then control how our systems go and essentially scan, monitor, and keep an eye on what's going on. So it's really about um, you know, providing a self-service portal that allows people to do that work themselves to, to make sure that what they're not doing is losing out uh, on a lot of noise. They're not getting the false positives. They are getting some useful um, information out of their service. So as, as you come down in scale to, to customers of different scale, how do those customers who maybe aren't as aware of cybersecurity now looking for a managed service, how do they know how to configure your portal? Well, that's the clever bit, I suppose, that, that we, you know, we are very good, I have to say, what we do in terms of cybersecurity. We understand the cybersecurity area and we have done enough implementations with a range of customers, yes, the very large ones, but indeed some smaller ones as well, to understand what their needs and requirements are and how to map those to, to the sort of day-to-day -day world that they understand rather than the sort of technology and, and the, the, um, the jargon that is in the cybersecurity world. So we do that, that mapping, we do that heavy lifting. We've got quite a lot of systems and we put a lot of effort into providing um, that way of abstracting some of that complexity and turning it into ways that are, are much more simple to understand. It still has to be run by an IT literate person. This is not a, an SME product in the sense that it's not for somebody who isn't um, IT literate, but it's, it's really not for the cybersecurity expert. It's trying to replace the cybersecurity expert with our systems to an extent. Okay, thank and, you. And how do you provide the service today? Is it cloud based, on premise? It's, it's a cloud based service. So it's, it's a, a genuine service. You, there is uh, normally, depending on the size of business configuration, there's often a small amount of software that you just download onto some of your systems. We can work in various ways, um, but typically, if you perhaps have, I know, half a dozen sites and you've got several hundred people, you probably will want to have a small bit of software just to act as a gateway, 
It increases security as well. Uh, and, and all that information automatically gets fed back to us and through our systems um, gets acted upon. They receive alerts if, if indeed alert is required. They receive obviously regular reporting and indeed they can go in and, and you know, work the system directly if they so need. Okay. Um, I just have one more question. There's been a lot of things in the news at the moment about um, ransomware and the big criticism of ransomware has been that the definitions within antivirus aren't able to keep up. So it gets through, it sits there for 30 days, and then when the backups have all gone through, it then just takes over the system. Will this help with ransomware? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the key things that we're trying to push across is, yes, dedicated you know, anti-ransomware software is good. And as with all things, you need a, a defense in depth type approach. You need lots of different layers to um, defending yourself from, from malicious attack. But yes, absolutely, um, in two key ways. First of all, um, by configuring your systems, and as I was saying earlier, that includes making sure that only the right people can get at the right bits of information, so that if, say, a ransomware appears on somebody's desktop and they double-click on it, maybe their own machine, maybe their own personal files get uh, encrypted, but at least it can't spread to the rest of the company. And the second way is your point about often it won't be triggered immediately um, by being able to see that, okay, there's a foreign bit of software that's appeared on this person's machine. Uh, you can immediately go, that shouldn't be there, let's investigate, let's take it off before the damage is done. Okay, excellent. Any other questions, guys? No? Okay, excellent. Andy, thank you. Thank very you very much, much indeed. indeed. Thank you, then. Let's go back into the How did Thank it you. go? Very good. Very good. Good, 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 good. Did you feel they got the concept? I and, think they uh, did very much. There's some very interesting questions, you know, good. some, I think, quite incisive questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think they absolutely got it. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, good luck in the rest of the competition. Thank you very much indeed. And, uh, yeah, we shall see you soon. Thank That's you very great. much for your time. Thanks, Cheers. Okay, so, let's bring in our next contestant, eh? So, without further ado, please do come in. Yeah, hi. Hi there. Hello. Welcome nice to Disruptive Pitch. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Good. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, to tell us a little bit, 30 seconds about the company. Okay. So my speaking to you? I <laughs> to that camera. <laughs> Hello. My name is Ian Thompson. I'm the Managing Director of Sigmantics. Sigmantics is a cybersecurity company and we focus on helping companies to understand cybersecurity attacks, either real or potential and managing any incidents that follow to completion, bringing in the appropriate security specialists um, so that it's clear at the end of a potential attack uh, if there are any resolutions that need to happen inside the company. And that's our service to small, medium and indeed large enterprises. Fantastic. Well, so how did you, uh, how did you hear about Disruptive Pitch? How, how, how come you're here? Uh, we were at InfoSec. Uh, which is a big security conference yeah, in no, June, we there ourselves. and we met Lucy Green, who's yep. organised this event, and Lucy has invited us to come along as a result of our meeting at InfoSec. Fantastic. Well, without further ado, I'll send you in on the judges. Good okay. luck. Thank you very we'll much. We'll see you back in here afterwards. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, next contestant goes into the judges. Let's see how he fares. Hello there. Hi. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and say what you do? Yes, uh, my name is Ian Thompson. I run a cyber security company called Sigmantics, not to be confused with the word semantics, <laughs> which uh, is the meaning of words. Sigmantics is the meaning of cyber security in some sense. And I, I run this small company here in London. Okay. And uh, tell us about Sigmantics. So, um, Sigmantics, um, we enable companies and the staff within companies to report potential uh, vulnerabilities and cyber attacks on them as individual as the, across their department or across their, the whole area. So they can uh, open up an app on their phone or on their computer or their tablet and they can report um, something that they're concerned about. And we encourage people to report by making it extremely easy for them to do that. And um, uh, at the moment in businesses, this, doesn't re this isn't really what companies enable people to do. Mm -hmm. They talk to the line manager, it peters out. Nothing gets done. 
um, unless they're in a fortunate situation where a real attack does take place, and then usually all hell breaks loose. So we enable staff to actually raise their concerns and know that something's getting done about it. We also um, allow the multiple security systems that may exist in a company to do exactly the same thing. If they feel it is a concern that's going to be broadly felt across the company, they can report that. And all of this information, which we call reporting, comes into an application that we've built and that we manage that allows all of this information to be assessed. And it can be assessed as rich information that may be hinting that there's some kind of event being planned in your company, or it can trigger an incident if you feel that it's at that point. We will then act as the incident manager and we built um, uh, software to help multiple people within a company participate in that incident response process online with, uh, uh, from their own phones or uh, from computers. So whether they're local uh, or they're out on business, they can immediately be mobilised to deal with this incident. So you can get the expertise from within the company involved in this incident. We are orchestrating the process. We will supplement the resources of the company with specialists in the cyber security area, so people who know about application security or information uh, or IT security or who need to do penetration testings of company or the legal department that need to be advised specifically on their obligations under the law or the police or indeed if it's a very big event, uh, the security services. So we will bring them in and escalate and run the orchestration of this activity. Um, now, one of the things that's important and is quite unusual about cybersecurity is it's very unclear normally what actually the situation is. You know, nobody, uh, it's not deterministic, it's probabilistic. We've probably been attacked or they've probably taken the data or they're probably going to use the data against us or they're probably going to bring down one of our industrial control systems. So in the early days, it can really be like that. So we use a very probabilistic approach to this, impact and probability, kind of a risk management approach that is familiar to managers, no matter what the background, whether they're cybersecurity or not cybersecurity, most people understand the concept of risk, impact and probability. So we will walk people through a process where we are actually triaging the risks, to use a technical term, a medical term. You're identifying the walking wounded and the dead, if you like, as we go through this attack, and you're coordinating your response to that with the appropriate resources at the appropriate time. Of course, the objective of this is to reduce the impact and to make a recovery from the process as quickly as you can. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Ian, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, for my understanding of the pitch that you've just done, um, contact management in a disaster for uh, once a, an outbreak has happened, mm -hmm. that's one element, and also intrusion detection for an event that may happen in the future. Mm -hmm. That's two elements, I think, that I took away from that. Mm -hmm. Does that include, I guess, business continuity management or, or part of that culture of that organisation? You talk about response management, I, think, I guess. So, um, in an organisation, you have the concept of contingency planning. Contingency planning, um, up to this point, has been around business continuity and disaster recovery. They're mature products in the organisation. So. A company will have a disaster recovery plan and in most cases that means they have another building to go to in the event there's a, uh, there's a disaster. Um, now there's a third contingency planning element being added to business and that's cyber. So cyber is a new area and an area that people are not familiar with. So that's the area that we focus in. So we're not focused on business continuity in the traditional sense or disaster recovery in the traditional sense but we are focused on cyber. But cyber is all encompassing. And you can find that a cyber attack does affect your business and its continuity, and it does require the disaster recovery plan to be put in place. So in some senses, it's the granddaddy 
of contingency planning. Mm -hmm. And this is why it's so difficult for companies to actually address it, because it's so wide sweeping. And um, I mean, it hasn't always been like this. Cyber has uh, crept up on businesses and suddenly become a major problem, one that people didn't anticipate. That's why there isn't many services there. That's why we offer our service on, as you say, the proactive side and the reactive side. Hey, what does an ideal customer look like? Size, shape, industry? So there are certain features of a customer that make our service more attractive to them. One is the, um, so are they exposed to uh, a cyber attack? So have they got lots of uh, digital infrastructure? So that is an important thing. Not everybody has digital infrastructure. So for example, a good client is not a South African company, for example, because South Africa hasn't really digitized. It's an industry or really it's communications. It's a laggard. So a good customer is one in Britain because Britain is very much leading uh, this area as is the United States. The other thing to say is that are they holding other pe people's data? So if they're holding their own data, they're exposed, but at least it's an internalized risk. If they're holding other people's data, they've got other people's risk that they're underwriting. So that elevates it dramatically. And the more customers you have, and the more sensitive their data is, the bigger the risk. Um, so also, if you're a small company, it doesn't mean you're less vulnerable than a bigger company. They can literally clear all of your financial resources out of your company and you'll go bust overnight. That is as a bigger risk as for a bigger company, so it's not size orientated. In many ways, smaller companies are more wary of this because they don't have the resources to deal with it. At least large companies, they have safety operations centres, they have specialists that they employ, they have professional security people. They're trying hard to address it and they know it's a big risk. If you're a small company, you can't afford that. So you're, you're naked to this particular problem. And that's why we, are, uh, we pretty much offer our service to the small and medium enterprise. Um, and um, just to go back to your question, who's the ideal customer? Somebody that's investing a lot, a lot in IT, i.e. they're digitizing their company more and more, and they're in a race to do that. They've got more applications online. Uh, they've got more ap applications being built. They're going into the cloud. They're not too sure what it is. One of um, a customer that we're working with at the moment is a blockchain company. So they're building applications to do blockchain. And blockchain um, uh, inherently provides more security. But the, uh, because it's new technology, is intro introducing um, new problems and normally there's a big data a big base of customers that are using it so you may have hundreds or thousands of customers using the blockchain you're a company that's developed the app that's a very risky business because the technology you're using is not mature that and we're working with customers like that to make sure that their blockchain applications are secure and if they're not and you can't be totally sure that that is the case so we're putting our reporting an incident management system around that blockchain application so that they can deal with these problems that actually it's almost certain they're going to have and they contain the impact of it. A lot, a lot of this is... You say you encourage reporting uh, and that's the human element of people. H how do you help solve the biggest weakness in any company and its security is the people? So how do you manage that part of the risk beyond, please open this app if you think you've been done? Is, is there an education process or...? Well, um, so there is awareness and uh, that is an issue. Um, people not really, some people not very aware, aware of this. They love the technology, not really aware of the security. So there is an education process that needs to go on and any company needs to have an education process. We kind of assume that they've got an education process and that we'll put in um, like features that allow people to actually report things. In some senses, it's a bit like safety. Safety, you know, actually it's a very safe environment we work in and live in nowadays, but go back 
20 years, there was a lot more industrial accidents than there are now. And there was a, they, were, they brought in reporting, reporting potential incidents, and then they managed to contain the problems. It's a bit like that in cybersecurity. If you can, we're getting the staff to be aware, which actually will affect their behaviour, but also report so that something can be done about it. Because actually, I'm sure in your company, if you report a cyber incident, nothing gets done about it. Probably, that's the natural course of events. So we are uh, addressing that by giving people the tools uh, to do it. And they're naturally set up with phones and computers. It's mechanically easy to collect this information. It's like, well, why aren't we collecting it? So that's how we're going to bring people on board with it. Ian, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Into the green room. Okay. Welcome back. Thank you. How did you feel that went? Uh, yeah, it was fine, yeah. It yeah. was uh, a nice casual chat through the Good. world of cyber attacks and things Fantastic. like that. Fantastic. And do you think they got the concept and got the idea and what, what you needed to get across? Yeah, I think they, they understood that. I'm sure they've got lots more questions. It's difficult to imagine something unless you actually see it. Absolutely, especially and when it's a cyber security type thing, which is such a transparent sort of technology these days by design, but so important and such a vital well, part and cog of everyone's that, organization. You know, uh, to plug Sigmantics a little bit, go to sigmantics.com, create an account, and you'll see actually how it's done. It's not, we've made it uh, crystal clear how it can be done, and you can try it yourself. Fantastic, yeah. brilliant. Well, thank okay. you very much. Thank Good you. Luck, and I'll see you soon. Thank right, you very much. Cheers. Bye. So, we're on to our uh, last competitor, and uh, if we'd like to bring him straight in. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Fine. So what's your name and, uh, and what's your company? Andy Harris from Assyrian. Fantastic. And uh, how did you end up here today and uh, what's sort of the background of, of why, you're, why you're here and, and sort of who you are in 30 seconds, if you can? Um, I don't know why I'm here, but the background of Fantastic. why I'm here... Fantastic. The background of why I'm here is... Um, if you go back a few years, I invented a product called Mindsweeper, Mail Sweeper, Web Sweeper, and all the rest of it. And uh, that did very well. It got sold onto Baltimore, which didn't do quite so well. No. And then the management team, uh, well, parts of that management team, got together and formed an idea called Assyrium. Yep. And they uh, kidnapped me one day to look after their engineering team. So that's what I do at the moment. I, I well, loosely look after their engineering team, which is so good. I basically make the tea for them. Yeah, that's, that's what I do. I make the tea for the engineering team because they're that good. Brilliant. And then you come and pitch at these sort of things? No. <laughs> I think what's going to happen is I'm going to learn how to pitch at one of these things no, very, that's fine. very quickly. Hey, it's called on-the-job training and it's absolutely yeah. fine. Well, okay. good luck. Thank Enjoy. You very much. And we shall see you straight afterwards. Okay, fine. So, last pitcher. Let's see how he does. Hello there. Hi. Hi. Um, welcome. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and see what you do? All right, I'm Andy Harris. I work for Assyrium. I look after the engineering team, which, as I've just said, I, they're so good I actually just make the tea for them. <laughs> um, I probably drive little bits of direction of the product, which is speed of deployment, how easy things are to do, the usability and things like that. And I've seen, if you like, Assyrium through its early stages when it wasn't the privileged access management product it is today when it did something slightly different and then up through the aim listing that we did last year so we're now in the process of uh, boosting the team up so I'm now uh, recruiting some of the finest engineers I can I can lay my hands on and they are pretty good actually so, so you're, um, good. you're now aim listed fantastic yes yeah, yeah. wow um, how, how many years have you been operating um, the company itself goes all the way back to 2008, and in 2008, I don't think it had any employees at all. I, uh, I was actually doing something completely different, but in the same building as the early days of Assyrium, and as they walked past, I got interested and uh, gave them a little bit of money. That's how I got <coughs> one of the Very stories good. behind it all. <laughs> uh, so Assyrium, what does Assyrium actually do? What it does, what it does these days. Um, I'll take you on a little bit of a journey to get you there, and that is if you look at data breaches or attacks into companies, 99.8% of those involve privileged accounts. So pay dirt for hackers, crackers, whatever you want to call them, 
is a privileged account. They're looking for your domain admin account. They're looking for your main account, your config account. They're looking for a SAN account, a NAS account to steal things from you in the background. And the whole industry has grown up in two areas, really. It's grown up in firewalls, which are basically to stop people getting into these systems in the first place. And it's grown up as endpoint protection, which is to stop passwords and accounts being stolen off those systems. What's actually happened is 86% of all passwords are stolen directly from the desktop. About 10% of them are fished out of individuals, which is where you've socially engineered them and you fold them to take it out there. And about 4%, which is increasing actually, are brute forced. And the brute force is being increased because we are giving people crazy password policies. We are saying, you need a password that's 20 characters long. And people are now falling into the tokenization thing. So they're going, oh, it has to start with a capital letter. Or it has to have a capital letter. So they go, oh, Liverpool, 2016, exclamation mark. There you go, there's my password. So they've made it a tokenized problem so it's easier to get in. So realising that you're asking people to change loads of passwords and remember loads of passwords and that those passwords have been stolen from fundamentally insecure systems in the first place, the desktops, we decided that what we really ought to do is separate the people from the passwords. So we're separating the people from all the admin passwords, all the privileged passwords, we're completely changing them. We're making them very complex on the system, we're changing them, we're rolling them, making 128 characters long, 32 characters long in the case of some of the operating systems that can't take it and then we are identifying the users they come in so it's that classic case of identity in roll out so you arrive as Andy and uh, you leave as system admin or what have you I can explain it the other way around as, as if we were a bouncer so when we were building the product we, we realized that actually sysadmins were going to have to buy this product or people who manage sysadmins. So we thought, well, it's a bit like your favourite club suddenly needing a bouncer because there's bad people getting in. You've got to choose a bouncer. So we, we built the product to be the nicest bouncer you can imagine. So our product basically says, oh, hi, Andy, we, we've seen who you are. We know what your identity is. Here's all the systems you're allowed to get to. Here's all the roles you're allowed to get to. Oh, and by the way, if you've got a change ticket, just tell me what the numbers are and I'll fill that lot in for you. I'll track all your connections. I will record your connections. There is sort of fair play in here. And then as you drop off all those connections, it will close off the tickets for you. So actually, we do a lot more than that, but I think that's all I'm allowed. So there you go. I'm impressed that you know Ian's password. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Liverpool? No. 27 or something. Um, Andy. Yes. Um, so from my understanding, um, I would say that your intrusion detection with monitoring uh, and auditing, would that be right in saying that? I would say no, actually. Um, okay. Just to be mildly controversial. That's good. We do such a good job of making sure that people can't intrude in the first place that we don't do it. Okay. So a serum is a once only uh, or one instance only. So if you're Bob that comes into a serum and you, you get identified with your two-factor authentication and all the rest of it, so you're known as Bob as an identity, in the real sysadmin world, they don't sit at their desks all the time. They go off and they go somewhere else. Mm. And they come in again as Bob. A Syrian will go, hang on, that's two instances of Bob. We don't allow that. So the first instance of Bob will be destroyed. Right, so that all those windows and all the rest of it will be just logged out. So when Bob gets back to his desk, Bob goes, oh, I'm logged out. That's good because I know that was me. So if Bob did lose his two-factor authentication mechanism and he's working away and suddenly he gets logged out, it is pretty obvious that he's been compromised. So if you like, the intrusion detection part is more intrusion prevention. In fact, if you think about the industry today, we often use that phrase, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not when, it's if. Sorry, it's not if, it's when. The other way around, we, 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 we're trying to change that back to if by making it so secure and keeping you away from those things, we're actually getting right down to prevention instead of cure. Who's buying this? Oh, right, okay, so we had three classes of customers and the really easy ones to understand are anybody who looks like an MSP. So any, any managed security provider or managed security provider as a platform normally ends up dealing with thousands of servers and therefore they need to know thousands of passwords and they need to make many, many changes very, very quickly. So we have one of the big mobile telephone companies in the UK as one of our customers and they run five million tasks a year for our product. And I realise I've just said tasks and I've not talked to you about tasks. <laughs> but 
if you imagine that we've also built a technology that means people don't even have to log into machines in the first place, where we strip everything down into a task. So they just run tasks on, on the machine. So that's one class of customer. And that's really interesting because you start off with a security cell, and I can see all you guys are asking me security questions or you're thinking security. But actually, once you're running, you're into a workflow situation. So you're saying, these sysadmins and these DevOps, how can you get them to do more work? Or if you are a sysadmin and sysob listen, listening to this, I'll, I'll put it a nicer way. The work that you like to do is thinking work, not busy work. It is a pain in the, in the backside to go off to get the run book, to find out what the password is, to find out what the IP address is, to find out how you log into the machine and the list of things you have to do. You want to think about it. So if you think about Sirium as the bouncer, we've gone, hey, Bob, you need to be over here. Here you are. You can think about You can get more thinking work done. And it means you can take interesting tasks and put them down to your help desk. So now your help desk is doing more valuable tasks and your help desk is happier. And that's the important thing. So that, yeah, tasks, I end up thinking a lot about tasks as well. Now I'm answering the question before or last. Sorry about that. Yep. Andy? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done, well done. If you'd like to go back into the green room. <laughs> right. Thank you. Green room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Come feel me back in. So how do you feel that went? Uh, fine, we st Yeah, no, no, we have a quick, quick catch up afterwards. So okay. how do you feel that went? Um, it was, it was interesting because what interesting. happens is you take the roots of the questions that you're asked and I think that we covered about 60% of what we do and, yeah. I, and as I'm sitting here reflecting about it, I'm thinking, oh, I wish oh. you'd asked me that question, I wish you'd asked you know that what? question. One of the things I love that you mentioned is all about that locking, uh, sorry, that sort of, uh, how do you how do you offboard customers? Because yeah. for us, you know, people always ask me how do you how do you quantify a vendor lock-in or, or fundamental lock-in to a service provider? Yeah. And the truth is, lock-in is defined as how much it takes you, the risk and the cost of offboarding. So I think it's a really really clever, great comment. I if like that. If you're an MSP, by the way, and you do lose a customer, one of the things you want to do is reduce the cost Precisely. of offboarding. Of off because if you can reduce the cost, you've got more money left in the well, pot to do a better bid next exactly. year. Exactly, and plus you look a lot more, a lot less risky sort of uh, customer for people to go with. Yeah. No, right. fantastic. Look, really, really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you for your time. Right. And uh, yeah, we shall see you soon. Right. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, we've had our five contestants. We've had our, uh, our five ju our judges going to see everybody. Everyone's right. pitched. So now it's time for the judges to come together and, uh, and make their decisions. So, we'll see you after this break. The, uh, the last part of the disruptive pitch, uh, the first show. And I'm sitting here at the green room, they let me out, and uh, I'm here with Neil and Andy from Compare the Cloud, two of the judges, and we'll just have a quick chat about exactly uh, what we thought and, uh, and who goes through to the next round. So, Neil, Andy, take it away. Well, it's quite an interesting uh, bunch of people, yeah. I will say, mm -hmm. most diverse presenters that I've come across for a while. Some were brilliant. Some were good, some were bad. Um, in fact, no, no, that's, that's a bit harsh. Yeah, really. I, it was, some, yeah. some needed some refinement, I think, from their pitches. Well, right that's there. what this is all about. Yeah. We're, we're looking at pitches. I mean, this is it. People come across with the best technology in the world, maybe the best salespeople in the world, all sorts of things, but it's just getting that pitch mm. right. Yep. And we see that time and time again exactly. in this industry. It's all about the pitch. Which is the entire point of this whole project, right? Mm. This whole show. So, so, so we have analyze the pitches and come up with uh, who would be best suited for Team Andy and Team Neil. Yes. Okay. Um, in no particular order, I just want to give a summary, a brief summary on what we thought the, the pitches were like. Um, the first gentleman um, from Torreson. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. You know, Peter, Peter Bradley. Mm -hmm. um, access control, I think, to be honest, he had a very energetic presentation. Yeah. He seemed to really know what he was talking about too. Well, it ticks two of the many boxes. Really. Of course, of course. Um, however, I do think some of the del delivery needs a bit refining, without a doubt, because uh, some elements of it I was left wondering, actually, i no more educated than I first thought when I asked the question. Yeah. Um, but you know, apart from that, I think, you know, he's his market audience and the way that he's pitching there is, is 
pretty good, really. I think he, he knows his product set pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The AI was interesting. Very yeah, interesting. yeah. You had a had an eye on him, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, I, I did like the artificial intelligence aspects of it. Finance is not necessarily my um, area of expertise. Probably more yours, but um, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, interesting that Vigesh from Massive Analytics, the second chap up, mm. he video predictive analytics. That was interesting. Yeah, I mean, he his pitch came across very well. Mm. I, I did like the Oscar um, product that he has, but. I was particularly interested in this video analytics. Yeah. I, I thought that sure. was fascinating. It was uh, like Minor Minority Report. It was very much yeah. Tom Cruise. We can predict crime before it even mm. happens. I like that. Yeah. Precogs, like eh? that. Yes, precogs. Yeah. Um, and again, he knew his topic quite well too, actually. To be, and he answered questions very well, I thought. Um, next yeah. up was Asoria. Where? What did you think about that? When we were discussing about um, another cybersecurity product set. Mm. Um, it's difficult to differentiate uh, his product set from the others, actually, with the other cybersecurity company that came a bit, uh, a bit further down. But I don't think he, he, he pitched his product very well. I mean, I could be wrong, but... Um, I think the thing is, they, they're very much... From what I understood, they very much worked in the space of modern enterprise, defence, that kind of thing. They're real high-end things. Um, which would be very, it's, it's very difficult to then pitch to say, well, actually, we support these enormous organisations and we support the little companies. It's a, it's a big kind of jump. One of the things I'd say about Shuria that I quite liked was the fact that they, they disintermediated access control and mm. the thing mm. you're accessing, yep. which actually was quite nice to have that sort of intermediary piece. And I think as a service could scale right down, I think mm. as it's deployed at the moment, it's probably a little bit too high end. But there's certainly room for, for room for manoeuvre there. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it was interesting because I, I still found it hard uh, to see the, that that kind of differentiator. Mm. You know, and I, mm. maybe if he did that pitch again, maybe it would come across. Well, one of the things he said when he came back into the green room was that he didn't feel that he'd had the chance to sort yeah. of get everything out. So uh, yep. maybe we need to look into yeah. a bit more detail. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Thompson. From Sigmantics? Yes, it's a good name. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I liked it, I liked it, it was a good name. Um, it's a good pro again, it goes back to this idea of the, the large organisation, the police, and you yeah. spoke about big events. Mm. As a pitch, it was too long. Yeah. I, I was trying, it, it went into the five minutes, and I was like, I, 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 and it, was, it, it was very much, the pitch needs refined. Technology, good, pitch, mm. refined. I tend to agree with you that one, Andy. I think if we, to home in on anything that Ian presented, that I can say the two points I came away with mm. was um, intrusion detection, uh, insider threats, uh, and also uh, response management, which yeah. sort of fell into fell, fell into like BCP I think, to a degree. I think security is a very difficult one to yeah. pitch because when you you pitch security, you almost feel that you have to put say everything, mm. everything in mm. case someone hasn't understood yeah. it because you. And, you one of the fundamental, and I hear a lot of pictures from security people from, from the channel talking about security, and they always lead with the, this is why you should be scared. This is why you should be terrified. Don't terrify me. It's fine. I get, I get the risks. But um, I think one of the other problems with some of the startup security um, vendors fundamentally, and this is absolutely no sort of slight against who we had in today, is that you are competing against an incredibly established marketplace, you're, you're competing against incredibly well-known brands. And if you're the CIO of a big company, unless you're a security vendor going in with an incredibly unique proposition that essentially either complements or, or is completely unique to everything else in the marketplace, who are you gonna go with? You're gonna hang your hat on the well-known, well-branded sort of uh, security product, or are you gonna go with the unknown startup and say, do you know what? That's what I'm going to make my career on because that's what we're going to think about. These CIOs, they're hanging their hat on these vendors to make sure that they are not got egg on their face like so many have gone before. So. Did, you, did you think Ian came across quite well? I think, it, I mean, look, I think one of the problems with some of these guys is they are incredibly caught up in their own organisations. They're incredibly caught up in their own world. And I, and I totally appreciate that because mm. I've been there before. Mm. I think some of them, and I think one of the best things they're going to get out of this process is the ability to sometimes stand back and actually not feel like they've got to tell a thousand things, but mm. to feel like you'd be confident in one or two things and be absolutely crystal clear with them. Yep. I agree. Again, I think his pitch needs to be fine. I think the that's a theme. Great product, 
Yep. Refine the pitch. Great product. Yep. Which is fine. Presentation Place skills start need some refining. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, a Syrian. Andy. Syrian. Andy. What an animated it's character. A, he Andy. was a, an interesting character. Isn't mm. he? he was full he, of confidence. I like uh, that. I love the way he's a self-confessed tea maker. <laughs> well, let's be honest. Really it, worked, it worked for Google. Google yes. have what they have because they made it a really, really yeah. fun place to work. Yeah. So he's got the right idea. And uh, I must admit, he was the one I was most worried about pitching because mm. he's a deep, dark techie. Mm. He's a development yeah. manager. He's a VP engineering. Those guys are either absolutely mind-blowingly awesome because they are just animated and exciting, or oh my god, fall apart, yeah. tear my ears off to stop listening, boring. And he thankfully was the first. Mm. You've yeah. come a hell of a long way from 2008 to 2016. Mm. The name listed. It's no, exactly. Very impressive. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was. It, I'm trying to uh, put into context really what I feel. When I list, uh, when I think Neil. about it's not a day. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're back, because I, I, I came away because I know Andy's pitch was quite literally all over the place. So um, there wasn't any continuity flow, or the, and that's not, I, you know, it, I, it's not a bad reflection of the company whatsoever. I think Andy didn't come across as, as selling the project, a product mm, in a pitch kind of way. That's that means a techie. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, like? Yeah, I think be ideally, <laughs> ideally suited on your team, man. Yeah, I, um, I love the way he started with the story. Yeah, that's yeah, perfect. <laughs> it was good. You yeah, know, aim listed. That's come. Yeah, the company has come a long way. Yeah, two thousand eight. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think without a doubt, maybe um, that pitch would be more refined with distinct messages and points. Because yeah. I came away with at some stage uh, through while well, he was talking, I was questioning him. Where's your target audience? Is it for an end consumer? Is it from MSP? No, it's from MSP. Their target-based uh, market audience, mm. and we eventually got it out of him. But I shouldn't have to do that, really. No. No. But, okay, but so yeah. So, who's going through? Well, this? well. Who can we work with to refine the pitches to make the perfect pitch? Indeed. Well, we have decided. We have Drum decided. Drumroll, please. Um, Insert drum roll. For our unique scoring uh, capabilities. Um, Peter Bradley, Team Neil uh, from Toysom. And? And Vignesh from Massive Analytics for Team Andy. Yes, and let's give him a round of applause. Congratulations. But well done to everyone. Thank and a round of applause for our judges who. Yes, uh, thank, yes. You thank you, judges. Thank you, judges. We had Andy Johnson. From GTT and Ian Jeffs from Arrow ECS, who've hosted this Absolutely. lovely event. So, thank you very much. Would you like no? to read yeah. Thank you, Dave, as well. Hey, no problem. Yep. And thank you, guys. And thank no you. Problem. And uh, we'll be back next month with another uh, exciting set of uh, ISVs and services pri providers to, uh, to do this all over again. So, I hope you can join us then. But for now, from me, David, from him, Andrew. Andy, and from him, Neil. Neil. It's goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.